praise, Lord. We lift you up and we thank you for who you are. Jesus.
Abba Father, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are worthy of all praise, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You know that's the part I wanted us to get there. We'll sing it again. To you, our lives we raise. Amen. As a sacrifice, whatever you want us to do, whatever you want us to be, is that your prayer here this morning? You worthy of all praise. To you, our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are worthy of all praise. 
To you our lives we raise You are awesome in this place Mighty God We love you Father You know I believe that's I believe there's a lot of people here Saying that this morning I believe it I believe as people are saying There's people here willing to say God I'm willing to be a sacrifice for you, Lord God. God, and I thank you that as they step out in faith to say that, you're going to endow them with strength to be able to perform what you want in their lives. You're worthy for us to be able to do that for you because of what you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. We want to honor you, not just in the church house not just during praise and worship music but we want to honor you when we go outside these doors here just to let people know the goodness of Jesus we love you Father in Jesus name we pray Amen look at me right quick there's a big debate on Facebook I see an article every other article one article is folks don't like going around and hugging necks it must be a Yankee that uh, puts that article out because in the South, we do like hugging necks, all righty. Now, if you don't like hugging necks, just kind of wink at them. And the way I do it is if you don't like hugging somebody's neck, I grab their hand first. Bump shoulders like, what up? You know what I'm saying? All righty. So if you don't like hugging somebody's neck and they walk up to you, just shake your hand. So what's up? Now, we want to be not get in trouble like some of the people on the news nowadays get in trouble. We don't want to hug. We want to keep our hands appropriate when we're hugging. We don't do this and then lock us up or something, you know what I'm saying? But if you can take all that advice I just give you, go around and hug somebody's neck in the name of the Lord. We love you. I'm sorry. I say some stuff sometimes I just don't get sometimes. All righty. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this praise, mighty God. Tristan. <laughs> To you our lives we raise. All righty. Y'all walking around celebrating like Ole Miss won that Mississippi State game or something, huh? Right? Lord, have mercy. Or about how Alabama got beat by Ole Miss. Alabama got beat. I'm so disappointed. There was football games this weekend. Not that we worry about sports around here or anything, but. Yeah. Is it football season? Yeah, it's football. Yeah. yeah. Melanie, it is football season. You may be seated if you can. Home run. Hey, uh, we'll do the announcements after uh, offering, okay? We'll do the announcement after offering. All right, if you can, make your way. Right quick, look, I'm pumped. Next week, y'all should be pulling in here on Blacktop. Um, we're becoming an uptown church, huh? Amen. 
Praise God. We should be uh, should have it done by next week and get all our ramps coming into the sanctuary be better and our handicapped parking and visitors. Now look at me. How many of y'all are going to obey the signs? If I have a visitor sign there, I know you've been coming here for 25 years from the very beginning. And you ought to be able to park anywhere as you want to. But if I have a visitor sign and I see you pulled up in there, we're going to tow your car away. You hear me? We're going to tow it out of here. Couple, hey, couple Wednesday nights, couple Wednesday nights, I was patrolling the parking lot and making sure there wasn't no teenager kissing another teenager or something out there. You know how that kind of goes already. But anyway, I'm patrolling out there, and you know, because that does happen sometimes. You know, it ain't the end of the world. You know what I'm saying? Just don't do that no more. Uh, but anyway, um, I decided to write tickets to everybody that was parking incorrectly. So I got me a notepad, and I wrote on there the violation they have and stuck it on their window. We did not get no money, but I did write the citations out to everybody, all right? He, he gave my wife one. I gave her. She was parked yeah. in the wrong spot. Right. I specifically no spot. And they didn't see Folks in Hosanna think they own everything, so they just pull up here and park wherever they want to. Let, let me say this, too. I am, uh, I am grateful for you all giving. We, last week, we probably had... With the Thanksgiving offering and our regular giving. Because what, what, what has happened in the past, we say, okay, we're going to take a Thanksgiving offering up. What's happened in the past was most of you just took what you would normally give for your normal giving and you just give it as your Thanksgiving offering. But this year, I think it was the first year you got it. Give what you normally give and give a Thanksgiving offering above. And it don't have to be a lot, just whatever you prayed about. Amen. And we walked out of here last week, thank God, we're a little over $12,000, which is great. Amen. Both of them to combine together. So so to, uh, uh, we're thankful for that, grateful for that. And look at me, my big thing, my big prayer is, is that you get given. It's not me begging you for money is that you get the get given and if you can learn to hear the heart god's heart and you're in the area of giving uh you'll be okay i promise you amen so thank you so much and we're going to use it for the church here amen now look at that boy right there he got a little redneck in him when i got this uh, pants pulled up in his booth there when i was a kid we were taught if you had one leg put in that means you had 50 50 head of cattle man that means he got 100 head of cattle when you got your fan full, like, I like that. Boy, Kobe's good on them drums back there, ain't he? Thank you so much for your giving, what I'm trying to. And let's keep on going. Well, look at me. I'm, I, I'm, we're getting ready. I've been wanting to buy a rock climbing wall back here for those kids for a long time. And if everything come under estimation for the blacktop like they're supposed to and nothing comes in different, we're going to have a rock climbing wall in a couple weeks for those kids. And they... Why do I do that kind of stuff? Because if I can get your kids, you will begin to be faithful. <laughs> your kids wake up on Sunday morning begging to come to church and getting mad if we don't. <laughs> so we're going to get a big rock climbing wall. It's about 22 foot tall. And they, it's on an angle, so they got to climb. And if they fall, they just slide back down. And they run up to the top and get out and come slide down a big slide, plus all the other stuff. And what we do, we have a big party here one night, and we'll let all you adults get on that and try that some. All right, y'all want to? We, I realize we will probably need to rope it off in each direction and that kind of stuff because it's gonna be a our, limit, right? yeah, Arlene, get up here at the top of that thing and it fall over, you know, something like that. Yeah. Hey, one year, one year we were down there. I don't know why I'm talking like this. One year we were down there, and the generator shut off. It was running the bounces and the lights. Well, I wasn't paying no attention. I was thinking, my Lord, the lights are out. Not knowing that we had kids stuck <laughs> up in a bouncy and it's uh, inflated. I was in there picking up stuff, getting kids out. People were screaming. She was screaming, I believe baby's in there. And I'm like, oh, I'm trying. I'm trying. I can't help it, you know. You know. So, anyway. Can I have the ushers come up here? All that for something? I don't know. Thank you so much for all y'all coming up and helping. If y'all if y'all notice Brian's hair here there is kind of blind. But he's turned into the nature boy. Woo! Nature boy. Woo! But, okay. Uh uh nature boy there. Now nah, he's the Santa Claus on the train there, so we'll be blessed there. Y'all want to hold up and let us pray? Golly, y'all two just, y'all just get up, reared up. Y'all look cows at a newborn gate, ready to row, ain't you? We'll let a boy from Crowder pray.
Crowder, Crowder. Father, we just love you today, God. Thank you for what you've done for us, God. Thank you for um, the, the people in this church, God. Thank you for the lives you've changed. Thank you for my life that you've changed, and thank you for my family. Father, I thank you that you will bless back what people give. It's not a matter of us asking. You said in your word, if we give, we, will, we shall receive. So, God, thank you for that promise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 y'all have ever gone to a paint party before but you don't have to be artistically inclined at all um and someone will teach us how to paint and we are painting the um, baby jesus in the manger and it's so so cute um but it, there is a cost for it it's 30 dollars because we, they have to buy the canvases and all that and a professional person's coming in here to teach us how to paint so i encourage you to buy it december 19th it's a tuesday night so that first week of christmas break for your kids it's that Tuesday night, and um, I encourage you to come. It's going to be fun. Buy a ticket for a friend. Bring them. It's a great uh, outreach time because we're just going to get to, like I said, love on each other as women and just have a good time. $30. And with that, um, a portion of that is going to go to the kids' church and the youth group, so you'll be raising money for that too. And um, so you get to bring home the canvas. Oh, yes. Thank you, Miss Isla. The debt, so we only have two weeks to sell these tickets, so you can buy them today or you can buy them next Sunday. Um, but that's all the time that we had to sell these because we had to t tell them two weeks in advance. So, um, y'all jump on it. I'm telling you, it's going to be a lot of fun. We have conflict, don't we? Today we want to talk a little bit about conflict, how we can handle conflict, how we can work out conflict, because it, it, is, it, it is something that you will always have to face. Uh, 
Uh, it don't matter if you have conflict at work. If you're on the job side or at work, there's going to be conflict, isn't there? Difference of thing. I, I remember with Keelan raising his hand. I know he's in construction. I can remember I learned something real young in work. If I go to work for somebody, I may cut a rafter a little bit different. But when I'm working for them, I cut the rafter the way he wants it. If he's working for me, guess what? You cut the rafter the way I want it. And if I'm so, I've learned in life there's, a, there's different ways to handle conflict and be able to handle a uh, different situation. There's, you know, there's conflict on the athletic uh, field. I mean, if you go out there and you're a coach, there's always going to be some parent or somebody that wants it their way. They want their little Johnny to play or not. Little Johnny, you yelled at little Johnny and hurt his feelings. Or there's always conflict somewhere that's going to uh, go on in our life. How about family settings? There seems to always be conflict when it comes to uh, family settings. You know, uh, uh, the turkey's dry. It was, you know. Your mama probably knew that the turkey is dry and really didn't need your comment about it, you know, and or whatever the ordeal. There seems to always be conflicts. And then there's church settings. If you don't think there's conflict in church setting, you just, just hang around long enough. Sooner or later, there will be a fight over what color of carpet's the best. Mostly, is the sound too loud? Is it not loud enough? You know, the young people like to boom, 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 boom. You know, and older people's like, I can't hear anything going on because it's so loud. So conflict is just something that is going to be there. And how to my, uh, to work our way through conflicts a pretty big, big deal. Uh, and I think everybody is acquainted with uh, a marriage conflict, right? I mean, it's just there. I think the older you get, there becomes to be less conflict because uh, you get to know each other more and you know what you can get away with. Or not. You know, as you, as you get older, you know whether to walk across the mop floor or not. So there's all, as you in marriage, there seems to be conflict. And as you get older and wiser with each other, you kind of work through those type of conflicts. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example of what I've learned through the years. I normally wake up in the morning a little bit before 5 o'clock. Uh, uh, sit around and ponder what's going on. I get up, run into the living room, and uh, uh, fix some coffee. I go sit down and watch a little bit of news. Uh, coffee's done. I go get my coffee cup, put my little bit of honey in it, put a little bit of uh, 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 cream and stuff in it. I sit there and drink my coffee uh, and just ponder and think about the day. Try to get my plans. Okay, what am I going to do? I need to go visit so-and-so this morning. Oh, that just reminded me. I was going to say it anyway. Miss Velma uh, lives back here in a little trailer. She fell, uh, and, uh, but she's okay. But her heart, her heart's out of rhythm, so they're getting, their, getting her heart. They're taking it, and it's probably already done. They're going to stop her heart and get it going back in the rhythm and everything. So she's over in Oxford, so let's continue and be in prayer for her. Amen. She has absolutely nobody. No children, no one living or anything. We are her family. So uh, y'all be in blessing and be in prayer for her. Amen. So I wake up in the morning, get my coffee and all that kind of stuff, plan my day, plan who I'm going to visit, what kind of work I'm going to do, go in the office or whatever I'm going to do. Brandy normally wakes up somewhere between 6.30 and 7. So I normally take her in there and hand her a, a cup of coffee or she walks in and gets it before she gets out. Anyway, the coffee's ready. And there's where conflict can begin to happen. It can. It don't have to. It can. Because I have done set up all my game plans for the day before she's even gotten up. And if I'm not careful, I will allow her differences of ideals for the day conflict with my differences for the day, and there can be some fighting going on there or arguing going on there. What I have learned to do is be flexible with my plans, number one, until I've talked with my wife, or number two, if my plans are important enough, leave the house before she wakes up. <laughs> you know, one or the, one or the other. It, Either be flexible with my plans or get out of there as fast as I can where we won't fight over it, amen. And don't answer the phone until you got a lot part of it, you know, done there, amen. So that's kind of how, that's how I've kind of uh, learned to deal with it. And I, I, listen, to you, I've learned in my older age to be flexible with my plans, again, or leave the, leave the house. And the question is why? Because there's fixing to become a, con a, a, a collision of go different goals and desires. All of us are souls. All of us are emotional beings. 
All of us have desires and passion and likes and wants. And what happens in life, we don't learn how to communicate that. And sometimes we're, we're not vulnerable enough to be willing to tell our mate or tell somebody we work for, this is what I want. But we kind of hint around. And when we hint around at certain things, you hear me? When I hint around at certain things or say certain things and the person don't get it, then fights begin to take place. So we want to learn a little bit about conflict. We want to learn a little bit about how to handle ourselves, mainly in a mainly in a public setting. I used to look at my kids and pop them on the bad head and say, "Let me tell you something. There's folks looking at us. We can fight about this when we get to the house. We will fight about this later. I will break your legs. You hear me?" My mama told me that I, uh, mama told me when I was a kid, I don't really remember. My mama used to tell me we'd get ready to go into somebody's house and she'd slap me on the leg and say, you're going to get it again if you act up when you go in the house. So I'd always go into the house and they'd say, your children are so perfect, all right? And uh, it's because she beat me before we went into the house, amen. <laughs> so what is conflict? What is conflict? A conflict is a collision of divergent ideals or different ideals, interests, of persons. You hear me? Is a conflict is a coming together and people having different ideals or different thoughts. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 3 says it like this. Let's see if we can't read it. James chapter 4, verses start with verse 1. It says, where do you think, and this is out of the message translation. I normally use King James or New King James, but I, I'm not breaking this passage down. And the message does a great job in explaining it, okay? Uh, James chapter 4, verse 1 says, where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight it, fight for it deep inside yourself you lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it you want what isn't yours and you will risk violence to get your hands on it you wouldn't think to of just asking god for it would you and why not because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to you spoil children each one wanting their own way let's pray father we love you and I thank you, Lord God, that we're just going to get real here today and talk about things and see if we can't learn to be able to deal with conflict. Because what good is it, God, if we look good out there in the world, but we're destroying each other at home? What good is it, God, if we look good out there, but when, we, when people see us coming, they don't want to be around us because they know all we're going to do is bring conflict. Help us today to grow in your word and grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember this, every, every problem and every conflict and every time you deal with something, it always has history. Any conflict always has history because I'm dealing with people that believe this for a certain reason. They believe this for a certain reason. Each one of them has a history of believing something or a history of believing something. So conflict arises when you try to take those two different type of histories or two different type of belief systems and you put it together. People have different opinions or purposes that frustrate someone's goals or desire. Conflict happens is when I am wanting to do this right here, I've already set my mind on doing this, and somebody comes in and bumps my goals. I'm wanting to get over to do that, and I have five people stopping me, but I want to do that. You know, the husband's been thinking about all morning that he wants to go out and do this, crank the four-wheeler, make the yard, uh, start mowing grass, but the wife wants something else. This is my desire. This is my goal. And somebody else is coming in and bringing conflict into it, bringing problem into it. And when that begins to happen, anger and things begin to take place in our life. Different purposes and different passions. Uh, you could, uh, I, I see it on worship teams. I see it in churches. One person will want to do it this way. Another person will want to do it this way. And until maturity steps in and to work it, let things work out, there's always going to be conflict. Some, there's always going to be opinions. In my opinion, we are to do it this way. I think we are to do it this way. Can we pull up a definition of opinion there right quick? Let's see. An opinion is a view or judgment or appraisal formed in the mind about a particular matter, usually short of the facts. 
That's history. People have things in their heart and mind, and this is how they believe, and they think this is how it should take place. And when somebody comes in and bumps their opinion, there's where conflict begins to set in. Young married couples, mama did it this way, uh, well, my mama did it this way, and conflict begins to come in until you learn to do it the way y'all want to do it rather than the way uh, uh, the parents want to do it. At, by nature, okay, before we get into stuff, by nature we are all self-centered at heart. Y'all get that? By nature we are self-centered. We want to take care of our desires. Listen to me. Because we think our way is right. You hear me? Because we think our way is right. We're willing to fight for what we believe. Let's keep on going. Let's look at something. Sources of conflict. Where does these, where's, where's the, where, what is the button that gets pushed in my life or in our life for us to have conflict around us that we seem to always want to argue and fight? Number one is what, what I call road differences. What is a road difference? A road difference is, is a, a husband and wife. Some men think a woman is supposed to be barefoot and pregnant. Some women were raised by somebody that now that ain't how it is at our house. Some people think that women are to be submissive and quiet. And they'll try to misinterpret or misquote a scripture to prove it. Women submit to your husband. They don't even know the clue what that word there means or what that's about. So there's road differences to where people think this is how it ought to be and this is how it ought to be. And so I'm going to take on certain roles in my life. And because of that, when there begins to be a conflict in different roles, we get ourselves in big, big, big trouble. What about government and the citizens? You got police life matters and you got black lives matters and now you got white lives matters and you got all the lives matters and what happens is there begins to be a conflict between what is the role of government what is the role of citizens and when we don't deal with those differences in a correct way in a biblical way or a law-abiding way guess what there begins to be a collision of ideals and a collision of problem and conflict begins to set up in our lives. Sooner or later, in most all situations, there will be a collision. What about a boss employee? This is the way I want it done. Uh, since I, I own the business, I'm running the business, this is the way I want it done. But I think it needs to be done this way. So there begins to be a collision of ideals in where you got to be careful. At. Listen to me. If you're not writing a check, then you better, better learn how to communicate with them in a better way, or you better do it the way they want it to be done. Learn to communicate and work in those situations or you're going to get yourself in tr trouble. What about parent and children? There's a, uh, they're, they're, they're sooner or later, and most of you know, that there's going to begin to be conflict with the parents and with the children. You know why? Guys, parents, they're only with you maybe an hour or 30 minutes a day to where they're communicating with you. Other than that, they're around the world a whole lot longer than you. They're around schools that are a whole lot longer, and around long, around a, they're around schools a lot longer. And all those kids and all those people are pumping their ideals into them into the children. And if you have a different idea about the way uh, children should be raised, there's going to be conflict when y'all begin to discuss things. Conflict arises when your child has this role or this desire to do this. You have this desire to do this, and y'all do not know how to bring those things together. How many are getting hot in here right now? It ain't because my preaching is because of the heat on. Can we burn, turn a little bit of air on a little bit, all right? It just turn it, not freezes out, but let's bring a, a little bit of coolness in here, amen? So we're talking about a conflict, a conflict of roles that goes on. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about when it comes to conflict with children? Can I give you some advice? Learn to communicate with your children. Learn to communicate in a way where you can find out what's really on their heart and mind. 
If you can find out what's really on their heart and mind, then y'all can have an intelligent conversation about what's going on instead of fighting, yelling, and screaming, I'm not husband around hell. I'm the daddy, buddy. I'll break you. Listen to me. Well, that's fine. Do that. And then you're going to raise up a bunch of crazy children, all righty, or learn to communicate with them about what's going on more than just face value. Get down to the real what's, go, what's going on in your heart. What's, what's, what's on your mind right now? What can I do to help? And these are areas I can help or some areas that I can't help. It's learning to deal with each other based upon the different roles that we have. And sooner or later, there's going to be a collision. And if you want to have a healthy mindset and you want a healthy life, then you learn to deal with the conflict. Pull back a little bit. And is it, am I just wanting it my way? What if my way is not the right way? Are we at a point in our lives where are you secure enough in your relationship with God and secure enough in your just life in general that you can pull back long enough to decide whether I'm right or wrong? And if I'm wrong, it ain't that big of a deal. Next thing we have, value differences. Different worldviews. Different religious views. Hillary was kind of blown away when she first found out that folks really don't think a woman ought to be teaching, preaching, or ministering any of it. Most of America believes that. But we tore a passage of Scripture apart and looked at it and shown what it is to give her the confidence to deal with people that have a religious mindset about things they really don't have a clue. They read a passage of Scripture, not willing to study it, and they become a determination and a desire. So values are difference. Then we got political. I mean, think about it. Sitting in here right now in Hosanna, we got people that are Democrats, and we got people that are, are, are Republicans. My daddy was a yellow dog Democrat. I asked my daddy one time, I said, Daddy, if Jesus was a Republican, would you vote for him? He said, Son, Jesus wouldn't have been a Republican. <laughs> Where does this role come in at? Most of us sitting here today are more social conservatives than we are economical, economical conservatives. Most of us here. My daddy was a Democrat, not because of necessarily the trickle up economics. My daddy was a Democrat because he believed that the scripture says that a person who won't take care of the poor or oppressed and needy, he'll bring his indignation down on them. And you can see that in Ezekiel 22. It says that most people that are conservative are Republicans are Republicans because they do not believe that a person are abortion. So they will fight for their side. So in their brain, the Democrats saying, okay, you're willing to let the poor be poor, uh, uh, and you're willing to have a divorce, and so there's a conflict here. I say you can be both. I say that we can stand up for the poor, and we st should, can stand up for the people that are in need, and we'll let the financial gurus handle that type of business. But we are to be both instead of having a collision in details and in mind, instead of having conflict within it. I don't talk religion as a general rule of thumb around here. People want to talk to me and ask me what it's about. They want to put information for the Democrat Party or the Republican Party. I said, get out of here. You know why I say get out of here? Because most of us cannot handle just a decent conversation about what's really going on. We can't handle it. So I'm going to fight for what I believe, and you ain't going to change it. Instead of us learning to be able to deal with conflict and be able to discuss it with different ease. And so sooner or later, there will begin to be a fight over things that we think is right. Values, world views, political views, religious views. I know people that will not even listen to me preach because I believe in tongues. They just mark me off. Don't know my view on tongues. Don't matter my conversation on tongues. All they know is Damon Plummer speaks in tongues, and in their mind they imagine us being like on the things going on some TV that we're running around handling snakes and all that business, so they can't even hold a conversation with me because of that kind of stuff. Imagine that. Conflict all over some basic doctrine that probably neither one of us are completely right on the whole topic.
perceptional differences. Perceptional differences, it's kind of like this right here. Imagine you coming in from a hard day's work. You come in, your wife meets you at the door, she's smiling. And you're in your mind saying, well, today she has a two-year-old child been running around all day. And in the back of her mind, she's thinking, and back of his mind, he's thinking, things must have went pretty good today, so I'm going to go in and chill out a little bit and watch TV and just drink some coffee. She, he walks in, sits in his chair, and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> I, I thought everything was okay because you smiled. Okay, all I've done today. It's changed diapers. I'm sick and tired of diapers. There's a whole bag full of diapers. Perceptional differences. He come in and he seen a smile. So he perceived that everything was okay. You know what you need to learn to do? Walk through the door and say, hey, babe, I'm glad you got a smile on your face. How things go for you today? Do not say, what did you do today? <laughs> do not. What did I do? Say, how did your day go? Learn to communicate. And the sooner you learn to be able to do these type of things, the better off you will be. It's kind of like the story of um, her, hus uh, her wife looks over at her husband, and her husband's on the scale, and he's going. <laughs> and she looks over and laughs. <laughs> that ain't going to work. Boy, you too fat. That ain't going to work, being mean to each other. He goes, yeah, it'll work. She said, no, it don't work. He goes, yeah, it is, because when I suck in, I can see the numbers. <laughs> it's all about a perceptional difference. Perceptional difference. And what, what we've got to learn to do is communicate with, with each other about being, without being so defensive. And one reason why I know this so well, because I was a defensive person so much of my life. I felt like that if you were questioning any of my things, you were belittling me or I was lower. And that's not true. Learning to communicate with each other is a big deal or you're going to always have conflict. 80 to 90% of marriage problems start with perceived differences. They say something this way and you think that's how they mean it. That is not how they meant it. And y'all are fighting over stuff that you really, you, at the end of the day, you're wondering what you're fighting over. Stuff that don't even matter. Yes. Learning to communicate would solve a lot of problems. One time me and Brandy were having some problems over a situation while we were at this church. Probably about 15 years ago, we were having some problems. So, I went and paid $90 to stand in front of a psychologist. And I decided if I'm paying $90, I'm going to let her have it in front of him. I mean, we ain't going to go in there and say, yes, darling. I, yes, doctor, I don't feel good, you know. <laughs> I mean, if I pay $90, we laid the hammer down. I know that guy was looking at us like, and y'all are pastors because we were throwing down in there. I was... <laughs> and so he taught us, what y'all must learn to do is communicate. <laughs> so this is how we're going to communicate. Okay. We're going to hand you this card and when you have the card you are able to speak <laughs> when he or she gets finishing speaking the card will go in your hand and you will tell her what you heard I promise you the way what they're saying and what we're hearing guys is two different balls of wax Two different balls of wax. So listen to me. To keep conflict from happening, what we've got to learn to do is be able to learn how to communicate in effective ways. This years ago when we first got married, my wife made this comment to me. She goes, I love you. I'm just not in love with you anymore. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. You're, you can't be serious. I mean, rock my world. No, no, what do you mean? So every so often I'll look at her and say, you love me, you're just not in love with me anymore, huh? Oh, shut up. I didn't mean it like that. Well, that's how you said it, but that ain't what she meant. You see, I'm getting the conflict there. Learning to deal with conflict, guys, and it's a matter of really stopping and say, what did you just hear me say? 
And if they say something to you and that ain't how you meant it, stop and learn to communicate it in a different way. Stop long enough to make sure your marriage is important enough, your children are important enough, your witness as a Christian is important enough. Stop and say, no, that ain't what I meant. This is what, help me to understand what I'm trying to say to you. Before we kill each other and destroy each other in ways that we shouldn't. Next thing is identity crisis. One night at an insane asylum in this room, one guy jumps up on his bed and says, I am Napoleon. Another guy down there, a guy says, who told you were Napoleon? He jumps up, God told me I'm Napoleon. A guy down on this side said, I did not. Did y'all get that? I'm getting better because I used to tell jokes and mess them really all up really bad. <laughs> did I tell you about this 54-year-old 50, lady? This 54-year-old lady had a heart attack, you know what I'm saying? And on the way, they're, they're shocking her heart, and all of a sudden, the line goes straight, and it bee, and she dies, and she gets there to St. Peter. She said, St. Peter, I guess this is it. And he looked down and said, no, nah, you, you got 43 more years. You go back. So she goes back, and she wakes up, and the light goes away, and she's like, whoo. Well, everything's better. She, she says, Doc, come here. I need you to call in the plastic surgeon. <laughs> Calls in the plastic surgeon. She says, look, man, I want you to do something with all this. I want you to fix the eyes. I want you to make my lips nice. I, I want all kinds, you know, those, you know, those <laughs> things everybody does, you know. I, want to, I didn't want to say it. I didn't know how I could say it, but y'all know what I'm talking about. I want, I mean, and then bring in the blue, blue uh, beautician. I want, I want highlights, get the gray out of it. I want to look nice. when I, 43 more years, I want to look good when I come out of the hospital. They wheel her chair to the door. She jumps up out of the wheelchair at the door. She goes walking, and as soon as she steps across the road, an ambulance hit her. <laughs> Kills her. She gets to the Golden Gates and said, what happened, Peter? I thought I had four, uh, 43 more years. He goes, oh, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> identity crisis. You ever seen people have identity crisis? I won't tell you about some of the identity crisis we have at our house. That's some of them private things, you know what I'm saying? But identity crisis. Listen to me. The, there's, a, there's people that have identi identity crisis in their abilities. Mainly with men. They get to a certain age and they can't do physically what their mind says they can do. I'm talking about work. I'm talking about all the different things they function on. And if you think... See, for a man that's worked all his life and been able to do all these things all their life and then all of a sudden can't do it, there's a frustration that begins to go on in their mind. There's a conflict that goes on in their mind because they said they should be able to do this, and in their mind they're saying they can't do this anymore, and so they're having an identity crisis within themselves. It's the same thing with ladies. You know, ladies, you have an identity crisis as you begin to get older in life and you begin to compare yourself with other people, which is not healthy, amen. You don't know what crisis they may be having, but we have identity crisis based upon our ability. Some of you have identity crisis based upon your wealth or lack thereof. I know a particular person that is multi, multi, multi millionaire, but she constantly lives in fear that she may lose her money or go broke. And I'm like, why are you living in that type of fear? But constantly, the, and then there are some people that if God was to bless you tomorrow, you would, you would waste every penny of it. You know why? You think it's a borderline sin to be blessed and be wealthy. And so you have an identity crisis there, appearance crisis, intelligence crisis, culture or race crisis. Sooner or later, it will collide 
with each other if we don't learn to lay our desires down and learn to be able to communicate through the process without the arguing and fighting. Poor little buddy. Listen to me. The deepest identity that transcends all others is that I am a child of God first. Do you hear me? I am a child of God. That trumps any identity crisis, wealth crisis, finance. That, that trumps it all. I am a child of God. Therefore, there are certain rights that I have as a child of God that I can lean on and believe on. And I know that God is going to bring me through these things. I am a child of God first. And when I realize that I am a child of God, I will form convictions in my heart and mind that I will live with and will not deny. Only until you tell, show me where my convictions are wrong will I change. Amen. When it comes to a biblical belief in what Jesus Christ and what God's word tells us to do. My convictions, though, in Christ will sooner or later be costly. Y'all get that? Sooner or later, my convictions will become costly. Sooner or later, somebody is not going to agree with your biblical convictions. How will we handle ourselves there? Listen to this scripture right here. This is one that nobody likes to talk about it because nobody really studies it to see what's going on. Matthew 10, 34 through 39 says this. Do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What does that mean there? Did he really come to make y'all fight each other? Did he really raise you up as a mother and daughter to fight each other? What he's saying here, this would be the effects of his coming. When I was 19 years of age, I told my daddy I was going into the ministry. My dad begged me not to go into ministry. He told me you'll be poor all your life and all that type of business. Don't go into ministry. But there comes a point in time in your life, amen, that you got to stand up for what you believe in Christianity and believe in what Jesus Christ has done. If you don't do that, there may not be no conflict, but there's coming a point in your life that you will have to stand up for the things of God over your family, and it may not be so pretty. There are certain principles that you're going to do. Like one of them may be, I will no longer allow you to talk about my husband like that no more. Amen. I will no longer allow you to talk about my wife like that no longer. You're not going to talk about my children like that no longer. I'm raising them. You deal with it. There's going to come a conflict sooner or later within them. And so within a marriage, you got to learn to deal with those things or there will be struggles. Look what he says in verse 36. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than he is uh, more than me, he is not worthy of me. For he loves his son and daughter more than me, is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The whole point of the whole passage is, is there comes a point in time when the things that God calls you to do, your family ain't going to necessarily like it. I promise you, you take a bunch of fired up teenagers and they begin to love Jesus and they begin to pray and they go back into a household that's full of the devil, I promise you, they don't like it. I had a young man who played the saxophone for me for years. He was incredible. When he would do something maybe a little bit wrong, guess what they would do? They would tell him he can't go to church and lock him in his room. Really? Lock him from church, huh? So what I told him to do is just take your saxophone, obey your parents, and get up in that room and just worship the Lord with that saxophone. Every day you get in from school, do your work, and just worship the Lord on that saxophone. Amen. Sooner or later, there's going to be a collision of your beliefs and a collision of your values. You need to pray that you can work through it in Jesus' name. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 13. and getting ready to close here. 2 Timothy 3, 12 through 13 says, Yes, all who de desire to live godly in Christ Jesus 
will suffer persecution. Mainly nowadays. More and more nowadays. You know why? Because you are a stark reminder of the sin that they're living in. You expose them and their ideals. And you don't even got to say nothing. I, my beliefs get exposed regularly. 20 years ago, I'd have told them. I don't always tell them now because I realize they ain't going to listen. I'm going to live it out in front of them. Conflict. Learning to communicate within ourselves. See, in all these differences, the Scripture gives us as Christians God's will. In all these conflicts, God gives us His will in them if we would learn to listen. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says it like this. If then you were raised with Christ Jesus, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. God has called us and called you, called me to be a peacemaker. And that's hard. Because I got to, all my beliefs about a subject, sometimes I got to just got to bring them in submission and deal with it. You don't even know why I did what I did. And you, you jumping on me and just shut up. They ain't going to hear it. They're going to believe what they believe. It don't matter what you got to say. If you can't communicate through the process, just take it and move on. Listen to Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. People will declare that you are a son of God based upon your ability to be a peacemaker. Somebody that is not always in conflict with people. Somebody who's willing to work and communicate through these situations. They say, spiritually mature. That's what blessed there means. Spiritually mature are peacemakers. They shall be called, declared. People around them will say, they are sons and daughters of God. What do people call you? Are you a head-on collision? Do you seem to always argue and fight with everybody? Then maybe the problem might be you. The desires and thing that you have, you will fight for them to death. That's what the passage says. The problem is sometimes we got to just pull back and say, even though I might be right, somehow I may not be communicating it right. Do you dread going home because you know there's fixing to be a conflict? Do you come in and sit there and pat your foot because you don't know how, to, all you know how to do is yell. You don't know how to communicate, so you just sit there and to keep from punching somebody. And I've learned this, you can't out-argue a woman. They're better thinkers than you are. They can, they can go left brain, right brain, left brain, right brain. They can tell you the facts and put the emotion behind it. Now, this is the truth. You can't out-argue them. I can't out-argue Brandon. She can pull stuff out of her hat from 20 years ago. And before it's over, she done convinced me. You're right. I am sorry. But I've learned in that to be able to communicate back and forth. And try to help her to understand my desires. And after 30 years of marriage, it'll be, this year will be 30 years in December 27th. After 30 years of marriage, we're learning how to do some of that. The reason I can teach on conflict so well is because I've had a lot of it in my life. Mostly because I thought my ideals were correct and were willing to fight for it. But actually I was doing nothing but bringing damage to myself. They weren't calling me a son of God. You need to get y'all's head out of the gutter. 
Proverbs 15, 18 says this. Hot tempers start fights. A calm, cool spirit keeps the peace. Even a fool seems wise with his mouth shut. Proverbs 12, 18 says this. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Have you come to the place in your life before I act a fool? I'll allow you to kill me verbally before I will embarrass myself. A peacemaker is someone who has experienced the peace of God. Someone who regularly experiences the peace of God. In circumstances that you know conflict and different things, you've experienced the peace of God. Therefore, you're, you, you love it so much that you will protect it and you will not allow people to interrupt it. It's not worth the fight. I'm just going to stay in the peace. It ain't worth the hassle no more. It's not worth trying to prove it to you no more. I'm just going to have the peace of God in it. Like my daddy used to say, excuse my French, come hell or high water, baby. The peace of God is going to rule my heart and mind. Listen to me. And I could quote you the scripture, but I ain't. A peacemaker can have the peace of God because he knows God is at peace with him. God ain't up there in heaven going, oh! Can't believe he did it again. Oh! God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the process. And if you won't listen, sometimes he'll use outward circumstances to try to bump you in the line. But it's never because he's got an attitude with you. And if you can believe that, when you finally do wake up, you can stop, pull back, and say, I'm sorry, God, and be able to deal with the issues. That's the peace of God. A peacemaker, because he's at peace with God, and he is experiencing peace, seeks to live at peace with others. He, that's, they, that's their goal, to have peace with other people. A peacemaker walk up on somebody that's been 20 years and say, you know what, I'm a different person than I used to be 20 years ago. You may not even remember it. I just want to say, hey, I'm sorry. No, not afraid of the backlash because you're at peace with God. In fact, you know the collision's probably fixing to come. Yeah. But for me to be at peace, I just need to let you know that I might not have handled this situation right, and I'm sorry. That's what a person that's at peace does. They try to be at peace with people. A peacemaker, and I got two more points and I'm out here. A peacemaker proclaims peace to people. Medically, I love studying the mind. I study, I I read books, I read articles. The mind's an incredible thing. And if you study the people that are on so many things to help them deal with anxiety, there's so many people on things to help them to deal with depression. In fact, nowadays you can walk into the hospital and not feeling good, and they're going to tell you you're depressed. I mean, it is just a full. You're, th- th- that's what they're doing. A peacemaker sits down and tries to explain the peace of God. Feed shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I wish I could lay hands on you and all of a sudden you'd have peace. But most likely it's going to take some time and just reshaping your way of thinking life. And that's what I want to do and that's what I want you to do. 
Get at peace with God. Know the scriptural basis for the peace, covenant peace that he's made with you. And share that with people because that's what they need. They need that more than anything else you can give them. You hear me? Teenagers need it. They're fighting out there with things. They're conflict at home, conflict, conflict with their convictions. It's a big craziness. Be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. If half of you men would learn to simply do this, if somebody's talking with you and got some struggles, if half you men would just learn to grab your hand and say, bro, let me pray for you right quick. And they would hear another man just pray. It ain't got to be eloquent. It ain't got to be great. Just another man that maybe knows. Because there are women. That, wow, women lay hands. Lord, let peace come. You know, <laughs> men sometimes don't need that. Men just need another man to understand. You know what I'm saying? I promise you, if we would learn to do that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> let me get to my close, last point and shut this job down. All right. All right. Listen to this. Romans 15, 13 says right here. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Conflicts. We have them internally. We have them on the job site. We have them in marriage relationships. All of these things. And in closing, are you a head-on collision coming? Or are you a peacemaker? If you want to be a peacemaker, learn to communicate. Just learn to, I mean, it's hard. I know men, we're hard. We, men just make noises. <laughs> my two grandsons are like <clears throat> I found out reason why Buster can't hardly talk he's been watching Minions too much <laughs> on the way to Louisiana the other day I heard <laughs> I mean the whole time I mean that's all it was Minion you know Gracie can talk in complete sentences because we talk in complete sentences or Buster and them they just Minion <laughs> but that's how men are you know did you know I'm going to shut up after. Did you know that men, when they're born, they're born with their brain half damaged? Did you know that? It's true. Women put off a chemical in their body. Hey, women put off a chemical in their body that damages the man's right side of the brain. It's truth. I'm serious. That is not a joke. I'm telling you, study it. They put off a chemical that causes the man not to be able to function correctly on the right side of his brain. All he becomes is left brain dominant. Factual. Go study it. <laughs> Look at it. Prove me wrong next week. And so a man don't know how to technically learn or operate on his right side of the brain. So when you fall down crying, thinking you're going to get him to communicate, it don't work. His brain just goes smoking. <laughs> See, when I first learned how to communicate with my mama, oh my God, what I say to her, what I say to her, what I say to her. Brandy can cry just like that. Woo! I don't like. <laughs> Somebody go prove me wrong next week, find out if a part of the brain gets shut down and a woman puts a chemical off when the baby's in the belly. Go study it for me. Y'all you know, check it out for me. Huh? See, well. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to make this real simple for you. If you're here. And you just internally having a lot of conflict. You feel like you're that person. It's the head on collision coming. Peace is not something that you can really declare. Or yourself or haven't up to this day. We simply want to add our faith to yours. You heard the word of God preached. Faith is rising. We want to add our faith to yours in praying for you. 
that what the word was spoken. The Bible said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're here, I need some of my prayer team to come on down. If you're here, and maybe you're just struggling a little bit at peace, you're in the perfect place to come down and get prayer. And there's nobody going to judge you. Because first of all, they don't know what areas you may have need prayer in. Any of my other prayer. If you're here, why don't you just come on down now? Or if you're here, you want us to pray for you. Anybody? Make your way down. Best place I know. Because all we're doing is adding our faith to yours. That's all we're doing. We're just adding our faith to yours.